Keynesians are labor-based economics. The monetarists are money-based economics. But the Austrians, well, we're capital-based economics, right? That's our roots. That's our foundation. And so then we have to ask, well, what is our foundation? And so this takes us all the way back to uh, Eugen von Bombavert. And uh, Bombavert, there's a picture of him. Uh, in 1884, he published um, the first of three volumes on capital and interest. And this was the definitive collection for economists for at least a generation. Everyone read this. And um, this first volume, which is uh, Capital and Interest, A Critical History of the Economic Thought, was translated in English back in 1890 by this guy named William Smart uh, in Scotland. And he has done a fantastic job of it. There has been a new translation in the 50s by uh, Hans Sentholtz. And um, some people think that, that the smart translation's English flows a little bit better. But either one is, is very good. So um, when you have a lot of time, not much doing much, go ahead and jump into them. But, and they're well worth it. But uh, Bombavrk is not an easy read. Okay? He's not an easy read. So he sets up a question. Okay? And he asks, um, and he wants to answer is this. Suppose we have a machine, okay, and it produces $10,000 a year of output. And I know valuable, just, just go with it, right? $10,000 a year of value output for the next 10 years. Now, why is this machine not worth $100,000 right now? Okay, why is, because I multiply 10,000 by 10, right, 100,000, okay. Why is it not worth $100,000 right now? In other words, why is there a net return for the investor? Okay, this is the question that we want to answer. And so what Bombavrk does is basically he's asking, what is the nature and the source of interest rates? Okay, where do interest rates come from? And so what he does is he presents five different categories. Okay, the first volume is a history. Now, you guys don't have to copy all this down, okay? It's OK. Um, I'm going to give it to the guys here at Fee, and they're going to put it up on their web page. And if you email me at the end, you know, I'll, just, I'll just email this whole thing to you. Okay? So, so just you know, write what you want to write. Okay? There's more stuff up here just so that you can come back to it later on. Okay? But he breaks these, these interest rates down into five different categories, and then he smashes them all. Okay? That's, that's what he does. So the first one, which is the colorless theory, He's, uh, he's looking at Smith and Turgot, and he's saying, well, they're just merely asserting that there's this surplus value. And then he looks at uh, the productivity theories, and he smashes the productivity theories, and he says, there's no way that this works, right? Uh, and this is the stuff from uh, Jean-Baptiste Say. And then he's, he's got the, the abstinence theories that say, well, you know, you just don't consume stuff, and so voila, interest, you know, so he smashes that. And then there's the, the remuneration theory where he talks about labor has some sort of surplus value. And then we've got the exploitation, which is uh, on interest is an abridgment of, of wages. And, and so he goes through each of these page after page and just, he just smashes them, okay? So this is volume one, okay? So then time passes along. And he says, well, I'm going to give my answer in volume two. Okay. So volume two is 1889. Okay. This is several years later. But the English version comes out in 1891. So that's like a year later for the English version. And so what he does is he advances this idea of time preference. This is the origin of interest rates. Now, what's time preference? Time preference is the social rate at which people prefer present goods to future goods. Each individual prefers sooner to later. OK, so what does that mean? Well, if you have the choice, I could give you a million dollars right now or a million dollars a year from now. Which would you prefer? Well, now. Why? Because you can use it now. OK, so, so this is what we mean by time preference. And then we have this Keteris Paribus assumption here, which means holding everything else constant. Now, some people will say things like, I don't like ice in the winter, but I do like ice in the summer, so I'm willing to wait for ice. Well, there's something changing, isn't there? We're not holding all our ceteris paribus, are we? What's changing? Well, the seasons are changing. That's what's changing. And some people say, well, I don't want breakfast. Now I want breakfast at breakfast time. 
what's changing? Well, you're changing, right? Of course you don't want breakfast now. You just had lunch, you know, pizza. So, of course, right, things are changing. We're not holding Keter's Paravis. But this is time preference. Now, how does Bumbavrik explain it? And this is his, a quote from Bumbavrik. He says, present goods have a general greater subjective value than future and intermediate goods of equal quantity and quality. And since results derive from the ascribing of subjective value to determine objective exchange value, present goods have in general greater exchange value and a higher price than future and intermediate goods of the same kind and quality. Yes, for Bumbavrik, that's clear. <sighs> he is not easy to read. I mean, it, it's, it's fruitful. It just takes a while. Okay. So, Bumbavrik then in volume two basically comes up with three elements for interest rates. And the first two fall into this time preference category. Present wants are more intense than future wants. And secondly, many people underestimate future wants relative to the present because they lack imagination or willpower or, un, or are uncertain about their lifespan. So time preference, okay. Now number three, huh. present goods have a technical superiority over future goods. Roundaboutness is productive. Huh, now what is this? Is, didn't, didn't in volume one he just smash productivity theory? Yeah. He just smashed productivity theory. But now here in volume two he's saying, uh, roundaboutness, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Did he lapse? What happened? In volume one, which is 1884, Bombovic savages the productivity theory of interest. Then in volume two, what did he do? He presents it as a big component in the formation of interest rates. Great. Okay. Now, 1895, he clarifies his position. And what does he do? He shifts a little bit more to the time preference theory, a pure time preference theory. But he never completely expunges this productivity side. So Lord Robbins uh, puts it this way. Some people have thought, well, Lord Robbins was British, so maybe I should do it with a British accent. Some people have thought now. Some people have thought, in my judgment, not entirely without justification, that Bombovic was really letting productivity in by the back door, having, so to speak, with oaths and curses turned away productivity theory out by the front door. He denounced it in the terrific passage of the first volume of Capital and Interest, page after page after page, denouncing all productivity theories. But there it is. Hmm. So... Is it, is it that after discarding a productivity theory of interest in the first volume, he allows it to resurface then in, in the second volume, in, in his own positive theory? Well, Hayek says yes. If you look at the pure theory of capital, which is also the easiest book in the world to read, no. uh, he says, yeah, Bombovic characterized time preference as a determinant. Right? In fact, at, le at least in the short run. Okay, at least in the short run. Now, what did Bombovic mean? Well, this, this issue is still sort of open to debate. Uh, but I think in order to understand Bombovic, we need to look at his, his capital theory. So, in order to understand his interest rate theory and then figure out what is correct, we need to look at, at capital theory. Okay? So what is Austrian capital theory? Well, it's not like modern neoclassical theory. Okay? Why? Because the Austrians look at capital as being heterogeneous. What does that mean? It's not alike. Typewriters are not the same as cell phones. I know. Shocking. It's true. I think so. Now, Bombovic, in his analysis, he built upon Menger. And Menger made this distinction between higher order goods, which is earlier stages in production, and lower order goods, which is later stages of production. So if I want to uh, make this uh, wooden podium over here, right, what do I have to do? Well, I have to knock down the tree. And then I have to turn, take that tree to the sawmill, turn it into boards, and then they convert it into this, and it goes to a wholesaler, and then a retailer, and then eventually, right, it takes time. There is a production 
process. There are stages of production, and that becomes important later on in our analysis, as we will see. So, von Bauberg then, he argues that there's this definite time element and a structure to the production process. And what happened then was an American economist, whose name is John Bates Clark, gets into a fight with him. He picks a fight. Actually, he writes uh, an article in 1893 on the genesis of capital, and then Bombavik, being Bombavik, could not help but respond. So this argument then comes up, and it, and it goes through the early 90s, and then it sort of dies down. And then a decade later, it picks up again, and they have the same fight over the same arguments, over the same points, and then it dies down. And then in the 1930s, Frank Knight, who's a student of Clark, gets into a fight over capital theory with F.A. Hayek, who is a student of the Austrian school, and they have another fight on the exact same points. What does that tell you? There are ships passing in the night. They're, they are never going to see eye to eye. Now, we'll see a little bit later on the implication of, uh, of uh, the role of Frank Knight because his student is Milton Friedman. Mm. So how then exactly does Austrian capital theory work? Okay, well, the way Bombavik starts is the way a lot of Austrians start. And they say, imagine a lone, single, solitary person on an island, Robinson Crusoe. And my students look at me blankly. And I say, all right, imagine Tom Hanks in the movie Castaway. Wilson! OK, he's all alone, and he is hungry, he's cold, he needs shelter. OK, what is he going to do? He's going to feed himself first. What are the necessary factors of production needed to feed himself? Okay, there are three original factors of production. So what are they? Well, the first thing you need is the natural resource. Right? Ta-da, there it is, natural resource. You need berries. Okay, then what? Well, labor, right? You have to pick the berries. And the third component is time. See, he's wearing a watch. I was like, oh, look at that. How cool. I can put this all together in one slide. How sweet is that? Okay, so... Okay, it was a minor victory for me. So, so basically then, we, we need these three factors of production, and that's all we need in order for us to have a very meager existence. Okay? Now, in order for us to survive and prosper, we need to get at least enough berries for us to survive. So if... Tom Hanks is on the island, and he needs 10 units of berries in order to survive, and he's only able to pick eight? Well, then, you know, he's not going to have a very long life. If he's only able to pick 10 units of berries, well, then he's going to have a very miserable existence. But let's suppose he's able to pick 15 units of berries. Then what? Well, he could work two-thirds of a day and then take the rest of the day off. Or... He could work all day, collect 15 units, and put five aside. And then what? Well, work half a day the next day. Or do what? He could work 15, uh, work the next day, and then he can consume 10, and then he can set 10 aside. And then do what? Take a day off. When you take a day off, that's consuming leisure. But instead of consuming leisure, what could he do? He could do something else. He could eat those 10 berries that he saved, that he set aside, and he could do something else. Maybe he might fashion a tool, like a stick, to knock down fruit off trees so that he doesn't have to climb up the damn tree to get the food. Now, why would he do that? Well, a couple of reasons. One, he might be able to get food that he couldn't get before. And, or, he might be able to get food at a much higher rate, right? He could be more productive. So what is he doing? He is fashioning capital out of his savings. So savings then comes first. Then we invest, and then we create capital equipment. Why? Because it makes us more productive. That's the intent. And if things work out and are successful, then we have a higher living standard. 
This is how we grow. And so capital, then, is not an original factor of production. Capital, then, comes from savings. Okay? It comes from the original factors of production. Now, we break capital into three different categories. The first one is capital equipment. Right? It's, it's the berry picker. It's the thing that helps us um, pick these things. The second one is intermediate capital. I knock down the tree, I turn it into boards, I take the boards to the sawmill, right? What is this? This is goods in process, right? It's moving it through the structure of production. And then, in an economy such as ours, we have financial capital, okay? And this flows in the opposite direction of the goods and services because when I sell a good, what am I doing? I am buying or receiving money. And so financial capital moves in the opposite direction through the structure of production. And that's uh, the 100 uh, shilling note uh, before Austria went on to the euro. And who, whose face is on that? The only economist ever on money. Awesome. Actually, now I think Adam Smith has been on something. But at the time, yeah. Boom. Good guy. OK, so how did Bombover conceptualize the structure of production? Well, of course, concentric circles, because that just makes more sense than anything else. <sighs> so what does he do? He's got in the, in the outermost ring goods that will uh, become consumer goods within the next year. And then as we work our way in, then it's two years. And then in the center, it's, it's the, the longest amount of time. So in order to make the economy more roundabout, more complex, what does it look like? Well, you start with this, and then voila! See, that's economic growth. Clear? Uh, no, no. So despite a lot of in, uh, insights that, that Bombovic has, th th this is not really a good tool for people to conceptualize. So what happens? Hayek comes along, and he redraws the structure of production. Okay, so in his series of lectures in, in 1931, he puts forth this sort of diagram, okay? Now, what do we have? On the vertical axis, we have time. Now, this has been criticized because you're trying to measure time? You can't measure time. No, we're not. We're not trying to measure time. It just sort of means this comes before that. Okay, this is the earlier stages, these are the later stages. This is the stuff closest to the, uh, to the consumer, this is the stuff far away from the consumer. That's all we're trying to say. And so then we have these different stages like raw materials, we have manufacturing, wholesale, retail. So I chop down the tree, I turn the tree into boards, I then take the boards to the sawmill and, right, and then we convert a podium, a wooden podium, right? Now, at each stage, we see that there are things happening, okay? Now, I have how many stages here? I have four stages. Are there only four stages in the economy? No, we're going to add more stages to it. And as a result, this gets called the Hayekian triangle, okay? Now, we've added to this. And in 2001, my... Uh, uh, professor Roger Garrison reformulates it. In fact, what he does is he tips this on its side, as you'll see right here. So he just rotates this picture around. Why? Well, we'll see that in the next lecture on business cycles, because what he does is he's going to combine it with several other graphs. Okay? And so what we're doing here is we're getting through the same sort of idea. We start with raw materials, we then move on to manufacturing, and then the wholesale and then retail. So, we've got intermediate capital goods doing what? They're flowing through the structure of production. You can, you can see the wood being transformed into this podium. And then they're doing what? They're being combined with the original factors of production. So we've got resources and labor combining at each and every stage with the wood as it flows through. Then, embedded at each stage, what we have is capital equipment, right? The sawmill has saws and other big machines that then use, use to turn the wood into usable products. And at each point in time, we are converting these things into things with higher valued use. And so we see the value growing, okay? We see the value growing. Why? Not because we're adding labor to it, 
That's labor theory of value. Why? Because we're making it more useful. The tree at the sawmill is more useful than a tree in the forest. Now, at each stage, what we see are markets. So we've got consumers on the far right-hand side, and they're doing what? They're demanding from the retailers. The retailers are supplying. There's a market there, supply and demand. And then the retailers do what? They demand from the wholesaler. But where does their demand come from? It comes from the consumers. So the demand is derived from the consumers. And then we see this demand imputed all the way through the entire structure of production. Now what about the supply curves? Where do they come from? Well, they start in the other direction. And this is actually an argument that leads into the calculation debate. Because what Mises points out is that in a capitalist system, in a free market economy, where we have private property rights, I own the lead mine. I own the, the apple orchard. I own the orange grove. And as a result, since I own it, I am able to then value it. And thus we have supply curves that mix through the structure of production. But if we don't have this, then what we end up with, he's taking away my board. Why are you taking away my board? So you can see, well, you should all sit in the middle. Sit. <laughs> So if we have a socialist world, who owns the means of production? The government does. Do we directly value means of production? Like if you went home and you saw on your front porch two tons of lead just sitting there on, right next to your front door, you go, woo, two tons of lead, woo. No, You'd be, that's not only a, not an economic good, that's an economic bad, who put that there? <laughs> we don't value these things directly, and as a result, because the state owns it all, there's no such thing as a supply curve. So even if we assume that the Borg come down from, from space and we can perfectly read all of our subjective valuations on final consumer goods, we still have no valuation on higher order goods. And the whole thing falls apart. Okay, but that's a bit of a digression. Okay, now we have more than four stages here. How many stages do we have? uncountably many. And so we just sort of smooth it out. And when we smooth it out, we have this thing called the, the Hayekian Triangle. Okay. Now, there's no particular telling where on structure production you might be. Right? We, we went to the mall yesterday, and we were trying to find the store, and I was looking for, well, okay, found the store, there it is. Now, where are we? And there's this big dot and says, you are here. Okay. You go to a company, and at the front gate of the company, there's no picture of the structure of production with a big red dot that says, we are here. Right? We can't do that. Okay? This is just a conceptual tool of what's going on. Okay? And then we've got recursive loops, and we've got dual purpose items, and so that just complicates it all. Okay? But what are we trying to get at? We're not trying to measure this thing. We are simply saying that there is a sequence, that there's heterogeneous capital here. And that's going to play a very important role when we get to business cycle research. Okay. So this then brings us to roundaboutness. And you say, roundaboutness? What an odd word. And I fully agree. If I could come up with a better word for roundaboutness, I would. Um, and then I would use it. Now, some people have used complexity. Yeah, okay. That also works. But honestly, maybe roundaboutness is the best we have. Um, and what is that? That's simply lengthening the structure of production, adding more stages. So Bambavark argued that in order to increase production of the capital structure, we have to become more roundabout, more complex. Now, why in the world would anyone ever want to do this? Right? You've, you've seen the, the game Mousetrap, where uh, you're trying to catch the mouse, and you build the, the net that falls on it. Before that, the marble has to hit the thing. But in order to make the marble move, you have to have the boot that does that. But the boot is held by a string that's held by a candle, and that's in, by a shotgun. And you've got this elaborate thing in order to catch the mouse. Okay, That sort of complexity, for complexity's sake, 
while fun, is not productive. Okay, not productive. Why in the world would we add complexity? Well, ask Tom Hanks. Right? He's on the island, and he's doing what? He is building a stick. Is that a more complex structure of production? Yes, because it adds another stage. Why does he do that? Two reasons. Higher productivity or a completely different product. Right? He can get fruit that he could never get from in, in any other way. So the purpose of adding of lengthening the production process is to increase profits. This could manifest as a, as a faster assembly line, uh, higher quality products, or more diverse products. And we need to just recognize that, that all for its own ends is just counterproductive. So what matters then is, is the overall structure production, not to, to get all bogged down into trying to measure the number of stages or the length of time or that, okay? It's a, it's a concept of complexity. And people look at the little triangle and they get mad at it, but it's just a triangle. It only has three sides. It can't do everything. Now, if we look at the auto manufacturers, right, and the, how did they used to do it? Well, they would go to a drafting board and they would draw out the dies and, uh, that would make the parts. But today, what do they do? They use computers, right? And instead of having to erase lines, you just move a line over here and, and problem solved. So much faster. So is that more complex? Is that lengthening the structure of production? Yes, it is. Because who made the computers? Where did those come from? Where did the software come from uh, that develops it all? And all of the steps in between. So we see that there's tremendous more complexity, that there's a tremendous more amount more of roundaboutness. But it's not purposeless. It's all for a goal, which is to do what? Is to make cars better, more efficient, and to crank them off the assembly line even faster. Okay. So, what have we learned so far? We've learned how economies grow. And this is what I call the magic formula for economic growth. Now, some people look at this and they think it's a secret formula. It's not a secret formula. You're allowed to go home and tell people, okay? Say, hey, guess what I learned? Magic formula for economic growth. So, where do we start with, right? There's Tom Hanks and he wants something else. So the first thing he has to do is save. And with that savings, he can then invest. That investment then leads to capital accumulation. And that capital accumulation then gives us a higher degree of productivity. We can do more. And if we can do more and produce more stuff, that leads to higher living standards. Now think about this. Where's consumption? Where's consumption in all this? Right? Here it is. Where is consumption? It's the more stuff, higher living standards. Isn't it? It's the end. It's the consequence of what we're doing. It's the result of what we're doing. Can we consume our way to growth? We can't. What starts this? Savings. What savings? Deferred consumption. By not consuming, we grow. It's the, the reverse of what we hear a lot of, especially from the traditional Keynesians. Now, there's another way of describing this magic formula, and it's simply this, says law. We produce in order to consume. Now, some people have heard of says law, and that's not what it was written in the textbooks. You see, John Maynard Keynes, in order to get his theory across, he first had to smash Say's Law, which is what? Well, it's a big, thick book, right? So if we're going to reduce this all down to one principle and then put it into a nice, neat little package, what is it? It's we produce in order to consume. But what did Keynes do? Did he take it on and, and argue it point by point? No, 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 no. What did he do? He took the lawyerly way out. Which is what? Redefine it and dismiss. So he redefines Say's law from produce in order to consume to supply creates its own demand. Notice that parallel, supply and produce and consume and demand. 
So in the sense, supply creates its own demand. Yeah, that's like produce in order to consume. But in another sense, what is it? Just because I supply balloons to little kids made out of lead, they're going to buy it? Give me a break. And he dismissed it. The most amazing thing is, is that professional economists, people who knew better, agreed. And I don't know why. It's a bit disturbing. But Say's Law was never refuted. It was simply redefined and dismissed. This is how economies grow. So let's take a look at this with our structure of production. Okay. So let's make the structure of production more roundabout. So we reduce consumption, and what does that do? That frees up savings, that allows us to invest, that allows us to increase the roundaboutness, the complexity of the economy. And if you were a Keynesian and you saw consumption doing this, what would you do? You'd freak out. but are we really reducing the size of the economy? Because what is going on at this consumption stage? I mean, how many people actually work at that consumption stage? Now, what is that stage? That's when you walk into a restaurant and they go, you want fries with that? Or, or in the South, right? Because we're in Atlanta and I'm from North Carolina. And he's like, you want your tie to be sweet or unsweet, right? That's the level of the consumer. How many people's parents and how many people just work at that level? Not many. Most people work in the higher levels of the structure of production. So what are we doing? We're shifting resources. And when we shift resources, we see that there's a decrease in the late stages of goods, but there's an increase in the early stages of the goods. Okay? There is a shift in resources. The factor markets that supply each of these stages, uh, they do what? They are each affected differently. And this is what we need to take into account. Now, how in the world do the other schools deal with this? They ignore it. They don't deal with this. So what does that tell you about their theories? Okay, so... This brings us back to our first question. Does roundaboutness, then, change the interest rate? Well, the first thing we need to do is distinguish between rents, what Pengrachik was talking about in his last lecture, and interest return. Now, every factor of production earns a return, and that's what we call a rent. So this return, then, is the price that's paid to the factor of production. For those of you who are uh, beyond your first class of economics, we call that the marginal product, okay, the marginal product. And so e every factor then earns this rent or this return that's equal to its marginal product. So in the example at the very beginning of the, of the talk, the rent is what? It's $10,000 a year, okay? So does marginal productivity explain the height of what? Interest? No. It explains the height of the factor's rental price. Of the rental price. But it doesn't explain why these rents should be discounted across time. Right? It explains the 10000 but it doesn't explain the discount. And that explanation then where is that? That's in time preference. That's the idea that people prefer sooner to later. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is solved in Rothbard and Frank Fetter. So if you go to uh, Frank Fetter's book, Rothbard has the introduction to, to that book, and he is, he is, that's his most clear pronouncement on this subject. He says, roundaboutness is an important aspect of the productivity of capital goods, no doubt about it. However, while this productivity may increase the rents to be derived from capital goods, it cannot account for an increase in the rate of interest return, that is, the ratio between the annual rents derived from these capital goods and their present price. That ratio, interest, is strictly determined by time preference. Okay, it's by time preference. So does that mean nothing else influences interest rates? No, of course not.
But what does it say? It says the necessary and sufficient condition for interest is time preference. Time preference and time preference alone is necessary and sufficient. Do other things influence market rates of interest? Absolutely. Risk, maturity structures, uh, we have uh, increase in the money supply, and so we see nominal interest, nominal interest rates moving all the time. Okay, But at its core, what's the necessary and sufficient condition for the formation of interest rates? The answer is time preference. And this is what the Austrians mean by the pure time preference theory of interest. Now, let's contrast this with the neoclassicals. So who is arguing with von Bawerk? Well, it's John Clark, right? John Bates Clark. And in 1893, he writes this essay, The Genesis of Capital. And he envisioned that capital is like, it's like a pool of water, right? You've got water flowing in, you've got water flowing out, and they give you this sort of picture. Now, when I think of pools of water, I like to think of lush, you know, tropical paradises. Is that now, now we're stuck with that. All right. Apparently not a very imaginative group. So the pool, though, is a perpetual stock of resources. The, the level of the pool doesn't change. You've got water flowing in, you've got water flowing out, but the level is maintained by the market. And the distinction then is, once we fill it up to a certain height, we don't need time anymore. And more importantly, this stock of capital, this pool, it's homogeneous. It's a big pool of K. K is the letter that they use for capital. Not even C. Why? Because that's consumption. OK. So big homogeneous pool of K. So Clark then, what does he do? He claims that time was needed to build the factory. True enough. But once we get it up and running, you don't need to wait anymore. Right? As long as we have continuous inputs and continuous outputs, one sticks the raw materials in one side, you don't have to wait. Right? You just stick it in, big black box happens, something happens, we don't know, don't even care about, and then, hey, look, there's shoes that come out the other side. You stick the leather in, and oh, look, shoes. There's no waiting. Why would we wait? That's sort of crazy to think that there's waiting. I mean, the only time you ever have to wait is when we initially build that first factory. And what did he call this process? He called it synchronicity. Okay, called this process synchronicity. So, capital then, this homogeneous blob of K, or pool of capital, could be shaped or molded into anything. So, he presents this example of this, this whaling ship. Right? What is it? It's transformed into a shoe factory. How in the world does that happen? All right, how does that, how do you turn, you know, it's almost like a, a riddle from uh, Alice in Wonderland. How was a raving like a writing desk? Well, how was a, a whaling ship turned into a shoe factory? Well, a couple of things. He says that the returns from the whaling ship then are not reinvested in the whaling ship. Okay? Instead of paying them out as dividends, they're, re they're retained earnings, but they're channeled into the funding of, of the uh, of the shoe factory. And secondly, the, the ship is wearing out. It's depreciating. And after this process, at the very end, when the, the whaling ship falls apart, we've got ourselves a shoe factory. And that's how this pool of capital is this homogeneous blob, and we can shape it into basically anything that we want. So, as you guys can see, Clark denied the need for time. There's no waiting. Why would we wait? And so here's a quote from him. He says, abstinence then originates new capital. It diverts income money from the expenditure that would secure goods for consumption to that which secures instruments of production. But once that capital's in place, we don't need to wait anymore. So as a result, time then is no longer needed. Right? It's no longer to be used as the basis of interest. And so what did he use? He uses the productivity theory of interest. And he says, the power of capital to create product is then the basis of interest. So he says it's productivity. 
So what does Bambavrk uh, say about this? Bambavrk replies, like Bambavrk does, he, he, he is a lawyer by training and a bit of an argumentative type person, a smidge. Um, and he doesn't suffer fools gladly, so any little thing that he sees, he'll, he'll go after. So he goes after Clark, and he says that Clark's analysis of changing capital goods and a, and a permanent capital fund is based entirely upon analogies. Okay, And he, he says, when you argue by analogy, that's just flat out wrong. And here's this quote by Bumbavrk. It's a little long, but I love it, so I'm going to force it upon you, so just deal with it. Okay, he says, this is short for, for Bumbavrk, okay? Just, just go with it. He says, there seems to dwell in the human heart an enervating proneness for playing the poet in matters of science and for placing by the side of the common natural things and forces with which we have to do in the world of prose, visionary doubles in the form of all sorts of mystical beings and powers to which a semblance of reality is imparted by means of an elegant abstraction. I hold this practice to be fraught with the greatest danger to science. If one departs from the bare truths of nature by only a hair's breadth, scientific accuracy of thought is irretrievably lost. The sway of truth gives place to that of words and sounding phrases. Bombavrk, yeah, good guy. <laughs> irretrievably lost. Just by a hair's breadth, you missed it. Gone, you're out. Deviationist. <laughs> okay, so what is then the modern neoclassical concept of capital? So, who taught Frank Knight? Clark. And so, why is Frank Knight important? Well, Frank Knight is important. Well, one, he taught Milton Friedman. Okay, fair enough. What did Milton Friedman do? Monetarism. Uh, big macro theory, okay. Um, but what else did Knight create? Basically, he was the first one to explain this thing that we call the perfectly competitive model. Oh, yeah. So what do today's economists do? They freeze capital. They just put a line over it. There's capital, frozen. There's a production function. Output is a function of labor and frozen capital. What? Mm -hmm. And here's how they view it, right? Now, we've seen this before. These are the Knightian stages of production. Here's output, right? See output? What's our input? It's labor. Where's capital? No capital, it's frozen. Only labor. And then they say, well, if you want to, you know, go ahead and uh, relax that assumption. It'll just complicate the model a bit, but, but we get exactly the same conclusions. Really? Really? I don't think so. And even when economists tend to allow capital to vary, if you look at things like the solo growth models or the real business cycle theory, um, it's only allowed to do a little bit of functions within certain parameters. Right? And one of the big assumptions is that it's still homogeneous. It's a big blob. So it's just this blob that can expand or contract. So that's the way neoclassicals look at capital. Well, how do they then look at interest? Well, let's put aside Keynes', Keynes view of interest, which is very different. And we're just going to use the, the modern approach of most economists, which is the loanable funds approach. So what do we have? Well, we get a graph that looks something like this, right? We've got an interest rate, we have the quantity of loanable funds, and we have the suppliers here, these are the savers, and then we have the demanders over here, and these are the borrowers, okay? The supply side, the people who are saving, well, this is the subjective time preference side of it. Okay, so far so good. But the demand side is portrayed as the objective productivity component. So you see it's, it's uh, two blades of scissors. One's the subjective side, one's the objective side, and when the subjective hits the objective, that's where you have your market interest rate. 
What do the Austrians say? They say both sides are subjective. Both sides are subjective because these entrepreneurs are not looking at rents. That's the confusion, right? The productivity is the rent of the machine. That doesn't explain it. It's the time preference of the people who are investing their money and wanting a return. It's on that margin that they're making their, their demand for loanable funds. But the neoclassicals say it, one side is objective and one side is subjective. Okay, fine. If you're going to argue that, in order to argue for productivity theories to hold, then we have to do what? We have to at least be able to recognize how capital goods relate as either complements or substitutes. So is capital substitutable or complementary? Well, in the neoclassical framework, capital is homogeneous and perfectly substitutable. Okay, perfectly substitutable. But take a look at the real world. Does that assumption hold? Is all capital identical and perfectly substitutable? Is your toaster the same as a microwave, which is the same as your bicycle? Sure it is. So let's just do a quick example. Suppose you're a baker and you've got a delivery truck. Right? There he is, all happy guys, out making deliveries to all of your customers. Okay? Then what? Suppose you buy a second truck. Look at that. It's identical, isn't it? It's absolutely identical. Is that a substitute or a complement? Is that a substitute or a complement? I mean, they look the same. In fact, all I did was just copy-paste. Right? So they're the same. Now, in one scenario, the second truck is absolutely, definitely, 100% a substitute. Why? Because it's exactly identical to the first. Substitute. How could you not be any more substitutable? They're identical. But it can do the same, exactly the same job as the first truck. Uh -huh. However, it can also complement the first by simply giving it a different delivery route. Now I can have them both go out at the same time. And now what are they doing? They're sharing deliveries. I can make my deliveries runs faster. What are they? They're complements. Right? They're complements. Even though physically they're the same, they're complements. Now, what does this tell us? It's not the physicalness of the thing that determines whether or not the good is a complement or a substitute. Cla uh, neoclassical economists make this confusion all the time. They try to look at it and they say, well, that's a normal good and that's an inferior good. Right? You guys remember normal goods and inferior goods from, from uh, your basic principles of, of demand? Right? What's a normal good? A normal good is if your income goes up, you buy more. An inferior good is if your income goes up, you buy less. And so what are they, what's the example they say? Well, if your income goes up and you buy more shoes, that's a normal good. Okay, fair enough. But suppose you take the bus to work. Okay. Your income goes up. What do you do? You buy a car. What happens to your demand for bus tokens? It goes down. Inferior good. Oh. Clear as day. And then I was teaching at Auburn, and, and this girl raises her hand. She says, oh, you mean an inferior good is just like when we, take, uh, um, uh, when we fly over to the uh, south of France. I'm like, what? You know, when you fly over to the south of France, that's an inferior good. How? She said, well, you know, if we had more money, we'd just move there. <laughs> oh. Okay, fair enough, yes. Then I suppose under those conditions, yes, airplane trips to the south of France is an inferior good. Now what does that tell you? You can't just look at a good and go, you're inferior, right? You can't do that. You can't just look at a, at a good and say, you're a compliment. You can't just look at it and say, you're a substitute. 
You can't do that, even if it's Fruit Loops and Cheerios. You're like, but clearly those are substitutes. No, because what if you want all the sugary goodness of Fruit Loops, but you want to be health conscious with your Cheerios? You do what? You mix them together. Now they're compliments, right? It's a healthy sugary mix. So if we examine the real world, what do we see? We see that most capital is complementary patterns. Not substitutes, complements. This becomes really important. Because what the structure of production is doing is it's showing the degree of complementarity. That's the structure of production. It's showing complementarity. In other words, if all capital was substitutable, then the structure of production would be irrelevant. Why would you need a structure? If it's all completely substitutable, if it's all really homogeneous, what structure do you need? You don't need a structure. In fact, this is exactly what the neoclassicals do. They ignore the structure of production. There is no such thing. Why? Because we assume it away. So why, then, is the structure of production so important? Well, it leads to big insights that cannot be uncovered otherwise. Okay? And you've already started to, to get a glimpse of this, at least on the micro side, on how we look at complementarities and substitutabilities, about how capital has to hang together in order for us to have production. Right? Because think about the Soviet Union. You just make capital. That's all you have to do. You just increase the, the, the amount of K, and we're just going to be just as rich as everywhere else. Well, how'd that work out for them? Not so good. It's like, yeah, Cuba must be awesome. Michael Moore would say that, but everyone else, no, crazy. What do Keynesians do? When people save, consumption goes down, Keynesians do what? They panic. You can't have people saving. How horrible. In uh, 2001, we were in a recession, the dot-com bubble. Remember that? Yeah, so long ago. Okay, what did Bush do? We're going to give everyone a refund. Oh, okay, refund. What did people do with that refund? Well, we want them to go out there and buy TVs and other stuff, right? But what did people do with the money? Some people bought TVs, but the vast majority, like 60-some percent, did what? They paid down their debt. They paid off credit card bills. They saved. The economists went, oh, my gosh, what are you doing? The Austrians were like, hey, that worked. I can't believe that. That's pretty cool. Good for us. More savings. They tried it again in, in 08, in early, um, like spring of 08. And it had a similar effect, but, but more people spent than saved. You know, it was about 60% saved as opposed to the big number earlier. An Austrian says that we can reduce present consumption for the production of a future consumption. In fact, that's how we grow. That is how growth occurs. And what happens then is that we are lengthening the structure of production. The structure of production becomes more roundabout. And that's precisely what we want, if you want growth. And I do. So that's a normative statement. I realize that, but I want it. So there. So the capital-based approach then to macroeconomics is going to be in, in the next lecture on, on the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Okay, So this is going to lead into it. And, um, I think that starts in half an hour, but I think I have, what, 15 minutes for questions? Something like that? Now, uh, I, I put my email up, address up here because I, I don't want to talk to any of you guys. <laughs> I mean, I do this to my students. They're like, I didn't know if you wanted me to call you. Like, no, I gave you my phone number because I don't want you to call me. Crazy. So look, if, if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, just email me. Or if you have any questions on anything, email me, and I'll attempt to answer you in the most um, Obfuscate the way. No. I'll, I'll try to be clear that I can be. So, all right. Are we all ready for questions? You have your microphone. You're good. All right. Let's do it. Start picking people with questions. Oh, she's all right. First, so was it a right interpretation of? 
The second triangle that you sold, you staved off consumption, and the triangle became longer. The time, the time scale got longer. So that means staving off consumption makes the production process more roundabout, and that, in effect, is what causes the more well, more goods to be produced and more consumption later on. Yes. In the, in the next lecture, I'm actually going to get more into growth using using more than just that graph. Okay. But what we'll see, maybe I can skip back to it quickly or maybe not so quickly. It does, it does. Um, okay, so, so this, this, this line right here is, is the first step of a dynamic process, okay? So what's gonna happen is that entire line then if you give it more time, and so then we put these, these, this new capital structure into place, the whole thing then is going to shift, okay? Because then, then we'll have, like Tom Hanks, now he's able to take the stick, he's able to get more fruit, now he's able to collect, you know, 30 units a day, and so now he only has to work one day, and, and he has two free days to work on further capital goods, like a net for a fishing, or, or a spear for fishing, or, you know, make little things so he can catch crabs or whatever, but, which are delicious. And, uh, and so we see this is just a static model of a much broader, dynamic approach. And it, it doesn't, it's not a smooth adjustment either. Uh, it's, it's a wiggle, right? It's a wiggle. So, um, Hopefully you'll be impressed with with uh, with the, that slide of the next one, and if not, don't tell me. But if you are, you can tell me. Okay. Um, I was just going to ask if, uh, because I, you know, you say when the consumption goods go down, that can sort of freak out. But I mean, I don't think it's so much that consumption goes down that they freak out. I think what results from it, which is. Uh, or they claim that there's capital that's being unused and that for some reason we can't get the workers to that capital. So how do you respond to that sort of argument? That is a, an argument where they're using, um, well, I don't, I don't know if it's, it's that the workers can't get to the capital. What they're arguing is that wages and prices are sticky and they can't adjust that, that allows for transfer of resources and you get stuck in a recession or a depression. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about this in the business cycle lecture on, on the Keynesians. But um, if we simply assume that people become more patient, like that's going to happen, but just assume that people become more patient and they just start saving more. OK, fine. What happens? If people start saving more, then we see a decrease in consumption. And then those savings then get fed into investment, which then are able to create uh, more complex capital structures, which will benefit us over time. Okay. Uh, will they freak out over that? In the short term, absolutely they do. Right? You can't have, you know, because what, what is GDP? It's C plus I plus G plus net exports. And the, the largest component is C. Well, okay. And if C goes down, oh, we can't have that. No, well, yes and no, okay? And that's what I'm trying to show here, is that we'll have unemployment in certain sectors of the economy. But in other sectors of the economy, we're growing, okay? So there is a structural change, right? There are different types of unemployment. We have um, frictional unemployment, structural unemployment, and, and uh, cyclical unemployment. Well, this is a structural change, and so that's structural unemployment. And, and that's necessary for a healthy, growing economy. Imagine a world in which uh, the horse and buggy industry and all of its ancillary jobs were frozen. What would happen to the auto industry? It wouldn't have the resources to build cars. You need the con to, to let the, the, the horse and buggy industry and all their ancillary industries collapse to free up the resources so we can build an auto industry. Fair enough. Okay. 